So today is my last opportunity to finish the Pentateuch with you, and we have two <coughs> lecture periods. We'll be covering the book of Deuteronomy. For those who, uh, those who are watching by way of Facebook, uh, I'm in New Zealand, and it's October, mid-October, which is spring, and we've been having snow flurries out, out the window here. Uh, a lot of our students have never seen snow or have not seen it recently enough for their liking, so they're very excited to see it. <laughs> now, Deuteronomy is going to have a lot of material in it that's familiar from some of the previous books, uh, because Deuteronomy is a book in which it, it's almost entirely made up of four discourses that Moses gave. There's, there's some other material uh, th that would be, we might call appendices. Uh, there's three major discourses, and then there's the appendices, the appendixes, where they kind of cover miscellaneous points to finish it out, including, at the end, the death of Moses. So the life of Moses began at the be uh, to be recorded at the beginning of Exodus, and his death is recorded in uh, the end of Deuteronomy. So Exodus through Deuteronomy, these four books, are the lifetime of Moses. And in these discourses, Moses is now uh, addressing the second generation of the Israelites who have come out of Egypt. The first generation came out of Egypt in the Exodus and had the opportunity to enter the Promised Land because of their failure to take God at his word. God was angry at them about that. He said, well, you're not going to have that promise fulfilled to you anyway. Now, uh, your children will. So he made them wander for 40 days in the wilderness, and this was the end of that period. Uh, during that 40 years, everybody in Israel who was over 20 years old at the time of the Exodus was now dead, with the exception of Moses and two of the spies who had brought back the good report, Joshua and Caleb. Joshua would become the successor to Paul. In fact, we didn't make a big point of that in the book of Numbers, but in, in Numbers, uh, God had Paul lay hand. I just, Paul. I just finished teaching Acts this morning. I taught the staff in an hour, uh, the second half of the book of Acts, so I've got Paul on the, on the brain. I got to shift back to Moses here. Um, God had Moses lay his hands on Joshua to transfer leadership to him. But, of course, until Moses died, he was still the, the, the leader, and Joshua was going to take over. So three men who had come out of Egypt were still alive. And that is three men who had been over 20 at that time. The, the people who had been under 20 at that time and who were born in the 40 years, uh, apart from these three men, everyone was 60 years old or younger in the whole country. And so Moses is going to die. This is given on the occasion where he anticipates dying, and he does die at the end of the book. And he wants to remind them of things, uh, warn them about things, predict things. And that's what these discourses are about. Now, in doing so, he often will go over material that we've already covered. He'll tell some of the same stories. He's going to retell them. In some ways, the stories will supplement the telling of them that we had already in the book of Numbers. There will be information given uh, about those stories that is different and additional to what Numbers was. So, in a sense, some of these narratives in Deuteronomy supplement the book of Numbers a little bit like the four Gospels supplement each other or as the books of Chronicles. You don't know this yet if you haven't studied them, but the books of Chronicles actually are parallel to the books of Samuel and Kings and, and give supplementary information. So there are different books of the Bible that tell the same stories as other books of the Bible, and giving new information. And so the narrative of uh, some of these things that Moses says in his sermons is going to retell stories that we already are familiar with, but we're going to get new details in some cases. Now the book of Deuteronomy is far more significant than you might think. Um, the word Deuteronomy, Greek, means second law. <coughs> and it's, in a sense, it's a second law, but it's really the same law being told a second time. You may remember that when the law was given at Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments were given in chapter 20 of Exodus. Then the next three chapters, chapters 21, 22, and 23 of Exodus, were miscellaneous laws that were applying the Ten Commandments to different life situations. This, these three chapters, 
Exodus chapter 21 through 23 are sometimes called the Book of the Covenant. You had the Ten Commandments engraved on stone, then you had the Book of the Covenant that was written down, which was uh, additional applications of the laws in the Ten Commandments. Now, of that Book of the Covenant in Exodus chapters 21 through 23, about 50% of that is found in Deuteronomy. That is, that Moses repeats a lot of the laws. There's some new laws, too. He gives... He gives a few new laws that aren't found in the uh, book of Exodus or Leviticus, but mostly it's repetition. As I said, about 50% of the book of the covenant from Exodus is actually duplicated in Deuteronomy. But Deuteronomy is more than just a duplicate of what we've had. It has some very valuable features, as seen by the fact that it's quoted uh, 80 times in the New Testament. That's a lot of times. In fact, the New Testament writers, you know, they quoted from most of the Old Testament books. The book they quoted from the most frequently was Psalms. The, the book they quoted from second most frequently was Isaiah. And Deuteronomy was third. So you've got 39 books in the Old Testament. And the New Testament writers quote from most of them. But Deuteronomy holds the position of third place of the most frequently quoted books in the New Testament, 80 different times quoted in the New Testament. Now, Jesus himself quoted Deuteronomy 10 times in his teaching, and three of the times were when he was tempted in the wilderness. You know, when he went 40 days in the wilderness before his public ministry, and he was tempted by the devil. There are three temptations recorded in Matthew and in Luke, and uh, each time that Jesus was tempted, he quoted scripture. And each time he quoted scripture, he quoted Deuteronomy, which is kind of interesting. I mentioned before that Jesus' 40 days being tempted in the wilderness after his baptism is sort of like Israel's being 40 years tested in the wilderness after their passing through the Red Sea. And interestingly, Deuteronomy is a book that's, that recounts those 40 years of wandering. And Jesus quotes from that book during his 40 days of temptation. He, it's like the lessons that God gave Israel in their 40 years of wandering are the lessons that Jesus recounts in his 40 days of temptation when he resists the temptations that the devil brings to him. So every time that Jesus quoted a scripture when he was resisting temptation, it was quoted from Deuteronomy. And then in addition to those three times, there's another seven times Jesus quoted uh, from Deuteronomy. So it, Jesus and the other New Testament writers had a lot of use for Deuteronomy. And so did the Old Testament writers, because Deuteronomy is one of the two books that gives the Ten Commandments. You've got 66 books in the Bible, two of them list the Ten Commandments. One is Exodus, when they are first given, and then it's Deuteronomy chapter 5, when the next generation, Moses repeats them to them. Uh, now, if we didn't have Deuteronomy, we would still have the Ten Commandments in Exodus, but consider that the Ten Commandments have been perhaps the most influential block of Scripture in history. You know, most of Western civilization's legal code has been uh, drawn from the Ten Commandments in some measure. And so Western civilization depends very heavily on, these, on this information that's in Exodus and Deuteronomy. If we didn't have Exodus, we'd only have them in Deuteronomy. But Deuteronomy has something Exodus does not have. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, in verse 5, we have what's called the Shema. Shema, S-H-E-M-A. That's a Hebrew word. It means hear. What is the Shema? It's a statement which, in synagogues, Jews recite every Sabbath. The Shema is, Hear, O Israel. That's what's called the Shema. The first word is here, and Shema means here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Now, Jesus actually said that's the first and greatest commandment, which makes Deuteronomy pretty important because we only find it in Deuteronomy. If we didn't have Deuteronomy, we wouldn't have the most important commandment of them all. Not only do we have the Ten Commandments, we have the most important commandment, the first and great commandment, as Jesus called it. Now, when Jesus was asked what the great commandment of the law was, he said there's actually two. He quoted one from Deuteronomy, one from Leviticus. The Leviticus commandment was uh, love your neighbor as you love yourself. The Deuteronomy one was Deuteronomy 6, 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He said all the law 
and the prophets hangs on these two. So, if there are two commandments that are summaries of the entire duty of man, and one of them is found in Deuteronomy and only in Deuteronomy, then that makes it a pretty important book, especially since it's said to be the more important of the two. So we have in Deuteronomy these, you know, the, the record of these commands, and especially the shame of the great commandment. Um, there was a time in Israel's history that you will read about later in the books of Kings and Chronicles, where Israel had become so far from God that the priests even didn't know the law of God at all. It had been totally neglected, apparently for more than a generation. That's hard to imagine since it's the basis of Jewish religious life and the priests in the temple should probably be studying it and teaching it regularly. That was their, their role. Apparently they totally dropped the ball and, and lost track of the law. And there was a time because they had bad kings that were worshiping idols and things like that and, and the temple service was neglected. But Josiah, a young king who came to power in Judah, started to do some reforms to try to bring back the pure religion of Yahweh and, and get rid of idolatry. This happened partly because in his day, a priest named Hilkiah, who was involved in renovating the temple, the temple had apparently been left in disarray for some time, and Josiah said, we need to refurbish the temple and get it up to snuff. So as they were kind of cleaning it out, they found in some cubby hole somewhere a roll of Deuteronomy. And the priest opened it to read it, and he was totally unfamiliar with it. Yeah, the priests are supposed to be teaching the law. That's like their regular duty. And here's the priest who's never even, not only has he not taught it, he never, doesn't even know what it is when he sees it. That's how far Judah had drifted from obedience to the law at that time. But Hilkiah, the priest, took it to the king, Josiah. And it was read, as Josiah read it, he was very convicted. And he realized that Deuteronomy contains some curses that says if Israel breaks the covenant, God will curse them in all these ways. Deuteronomy 28 lists a huge catalog of curses that will come upon them if they're disobedient. And Josiah realized, well, we've been disobedient for a long time. We're under God's curse. And he tore his clothing, which is a Hebrew way of showing remorse and repentance and grief. And he instituted reforms that were good for his generation. They didn't last, unfortunately, because after he died... Israel went back, or Judah went back to their evil ways. But during the life of Josiah the king, he got rid of the idolatry, he got rid of the, um, you know, the, the fornication that was permitted and so forth in, the, in their culture. He got rid of a lot of things because of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy actually uh, brought about those reforms. So the book has had disproportionate influence on both Jewish history and Christian history, it's a very important book, obviously. Um, Paul made some spiritual applications to some laws that are found only in Deuteronomy. Um, and this is interesting, too, because, you know, I've mentioned there are moral laws and there are ritual laws. And we're not under the ritual laws. That is, we're not supposed to live under Jewish ritualism. We are, of course, obligated to live holy lives according to the moral standards that, are, that reflect God's character. But the ritual laws are not moral in themselves. And, and two of the laws in Deuteronomy we'd have to put in that category. One was you should not plow with an ox and an ass together, which has to do with farming. It doesn't have to do with morality. And the other one is you should not muzzle the ox as it treads out the grain, which also has to do with the treatment of animals. <laughs> now Paul quoted both of those passages, or he, he alluded to one and quoted the other. Uh, the, the law that he says, uh, you shall not uh, muzzle the ox as it treads out the grain, he quotes it twice. Uh, it's, it's an important one for him to make points with the Corinthians and with Timothy. In 1 Corinthians 9, 9, he quotes it. By the way, the law is in Deuteronomy 25, 4. Deuteronomy 25.4, do not muzzle the ox as it treads out the grain. Paul quotes it in 1 Corinthians 9.9 9, and also in 1 Timothy 5.18. 1 Timothy 5.18. Both places he's talking about the duty to support people who are in full-time ministry. And he's comparing them with the ox whose 
treading the grain. The ox is actually working for his master, and you're not supposed to muzzle the ox, which would prevent him from eating while he's working. So the idea here is that God doesn't want people to have to work and not have sufficient to eat. And when Paul quotes it in 1 Corinthians 9, the first time he quotes it, he says, as it is written, do not muzzle the ox as it treads out the grain. Then he says, does God care for oxen? Or does he say it for our sakes? Now it's interesting, Paul indicates that this, this law that was given in Deuteronomy that had to do essentially with agricultural practices, an oxen, animal rights, he says, well, does God have concern about oxen? Is, is he concerned about animal rights? He says, no, he's, this, is a, this represents something. The ox that's working for its master represents the, the Christian minister who is working for God. And he's telling the church they should not, not fail to support that, the ministers. And that would be uh, muzzling the ox if they did so. He also quotes, or he doesn't quote this when he just alludes to it. In Deuteronomy 21, 23, Deuteronomy 21, 23, says, Do not plow with an ox and an ass together. Now, Paul doesn't quote it, but he alludes to it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, in verse 14, where it says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, being yoked together is like two animals with a yoke. They're bound to each other by a yoke to pull a plow, usually or a cart, or something. Now the law said don't plow with an ox and an ass together, as you don't put, you don't yoke together an ox and an ass. And the reason would be because an ox is a clean animal, an ass is an unclean animal. You don't, you're not supposed to mix things that are clean and unclean. It's a ceremonial issue. But Paul sees a spiritual lesson in it. He's saying, you know, we Christians, we are clean. Non-Christians are not clean. We shouldn't be yoked together with unbelievers because we're like the, the, the ox and they're like the donkey. So one's clean, one's unclean. So this is, Paul sees these spiritual lessons. Now Paul doesn't believe that treating animals this way is necessarily a Christian duty. We're not under the law, but there are lessons that God revealed, spiritual lessons that are embodied in these laws. And so as you read these laws, you may find some of the things that that Paul didn't even mention, but he perhaps would have seen, just didn't have occasion to write about it. You may find that there's spiritual lessons in some of the laws, even some of the strange laws. For example, there's a strange law in Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 21 and uh, verse 23. And it says, cursed is everyone that is hanged on a tree. That's a very strange law. Cursed is everyone who's hanged on the tree. In the context, it's not talking about people being hanged by the neck till they're dead or even being crucified. It's talking about people who are executed or killed in war and, and as a further indignity against their corpse, it gets hanged up on display. This is, they didn't hang people in Old Testament times to kill them. But sometimes when somebody had been killed, a notorious uh, enemy, they would hang up his body for display. On a, on a tree. And so it's not even talking about someone dying on a tree, but someone who's already been killed and they're hanging on a tree. But the, the line is, cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. Now Paul is working in, in Galatians chapter 3 on the doctrine that Jesus took the curse of the law upon himself from us. He quotes this verse, and he also quotes... Uh, another verse in Deuteronomy, which is Deuteronomy 27, 26, which says, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in everything written in the law. Okay, so there's a curse on those who don't keep the law, and there's a curse on those who are hanged on a tree. What does Paul do with that? It's kind of interesting. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 and 13, where he quotes these, he says in verse 10, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things written in the book of the law. So there's a, that's Deuteronomy. Cursed is everyone who doesn't continue in everything. That means anyone who's broken a law is cursed. So we who are sinners, that's all of us, are under the curse of the law. Now Paul wants to argue that Jesus took the curse of the law on himself for us. 
But how could he come under the curse of the law without himself sinning? The curse is on sinners, on violators. Jesus, if he was a sinner, would not be able to die in our place. He'd have to die for his own sins, not for ours. But how then could a person who does not violate the law, how could he come under the curse of the law? Well, Paul finds this other scripture in Deuteronomy. Blessed, uh, cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. And he, he gives that one in verse, thir uh, verse uh, 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Now, although the statement, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, was not referencing Christ, it does, it's a strange law. Why would that even be in there? Well, Paul thinks it was in there in order to show that a person could come under a curse declared by the law without being a violator of the law. Jesus didn't violate the law, but he was hanged on a tree, and technically the law curses him for that, which means without becoming a sinner himself, he became accursed in terms of what the law said by being hanged. Therefore, he says, we were cursed we had the curse of the law upon us because we violated the law. And the law says in Deuteronomy, cursed is everyone who doesn't continue in all things written in the law. Well, we haven't, so we're cursed. The curse of the law is upon us. Well, Jesus took the curse of the law to him without breaking the law. Because the Bible doesn't forbid a man to be hung on a tree. It just says a man who is hung on a tree is, is cursed. Well, Jesus got hanged on a tree. And so the curse of the law is upon him. And Paul, rather innovatively, indicates that this is how Jesus could be said to have come under the curse of the law for us. He took the curse upon himself. Now, in addition to these various ways that Paul uses things in Deuteronomy, there is the fact that one of the great prophecies about the Messiah from the Pentateuch is found in Deuteronomy. This is found in chapter 18. And there, the Israelites are told that when Moses is gone, and he's no longer able to get words from the Lord for them, that is, they, whenever they needed to know what God wanted, Moses could tell them. But when he's gone, what are they going to do? Well, they might be tempted to try to get guidance from occultists. And this is brought up as something that's not something that is open to them. He tells them, don't do that at all. Um, but in Deuteronomy chapter 18, he, he warns them not to practice the occult, as I guess it is assumed that once Moses is gone, when they want to know supernatural revelations, they might go to witches and they might go to seances and things like that. So he says this in uh, Deuteronomy 18, uh, verse, uh, we could start reading at verse 9. When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire. That is, sacrificing a baby to Moloch that was called passing through the fire. Or a soothsayer, or, excuse me, or who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all those who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. Okay? Then he says in verse 15... The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, like Moses, from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. Okay? So don't be going to the occultists, but God's going to send you another prophet like me when I'm gone. And you'll listen to him. This comes up again a little later in verse 18. God says to Moses in, in Deuteronomy 18, 18, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and I will uh, put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear his words, which he speaks, I will require of him. Now, this might be thought to refer to Joshua, because he seems to be saying that when I'm gone, you don't need to go to occultus. There will be another person like me. Who can tell you what you're supposed to do? Well, after Moses died, the only guy that was raised up as a leader in that generation was Joshua. But the Christians understood this prophecy to be fulfilled in the Messiah. And apparently the Jews did too. 
although the Jews didn't recognize Jesus as the Messiah, they believed it was referring to the Messiah. Apparently Joshua being seen as a type of the Messiah, and he certainly is. Joshua is a type of Christ. But the Jews, because of this promise in Deuteronomy 18, anticipated a prophet. Now, some of them thought it would be the Messiah, some were not so sure. Because Moses doesn't say it's the Messiah, he just said there will be a prophet like me you're going to have to listen to. And the rabbis, by the way, their views of the Messiah in Jesus' day were very all over the map. There were lots of different views of what the Messiah would be like. One of, one of the things that caused confusion is they saw prophecies that speak, spoke about a Messiah who would die and suffer. But there were other prophecies about a Messiah who would be a victor over all his enemies and rule forever. They couldn't quite put that all together. There were rabbis in Jesus' day who taught that there's going to be two Messiahs. One, they called Messiah ben David, which would be the ruling Messiah. Ben means son of. So the Messiah, son of David, would be the ruling Messiah. And Messiah ben Joseph, they said, would be uh, the suffering Messiah. That's just a, a tradition the Jews had. That they're not correct. That's, that's, they're just trying to harmonize all the Old Testament information about the Messiah and say, how can, how can all this be true? So how, some, thought, some thought there were two. Some thought it would just be a man like David. Some thought it would be a heavenly being who comes down. There's all kinds of different views of the Messiah. Some thought the prophet that Moses spoke of would be the Messiah. And some weren't so sure. You might remember in John chapter 1 that the Pharisees came to John the Baptist. They said, are you the Messiah? And he said, no, I'm not the Messiah. They said, are you Elijah? He said, no, I'm not Elijah. Mm -hmm. They said, are you that prophet? He said, no. Now that prophet is referring back to Deuteronomy 18. They knew that there was someone that Moses said was going to come who was going to be the prophet. They obviously were distinguishing between him and the Messiah because they asked, are you the Messiah? Are you Elijah? Are you that prophet? Now, when Jesus fed the, the multitudes, the 5,000, in John chapter 6, it says that they said, surely this is that prophet who is to come. Mm -hmm. They identified Jesus as the prophet. It's not clear whether they thought he was going to be the Messiah, but they seemed to because it says they were going to come take him by force and make him king, which would have been putting him in a messianic position. So there, were, there was confusion about that, but not, not in the church there wasn't. After Pentecost, when the Spirit came, the, the Christians knew very well that the prophet that Moses spoke of is also the Messiah and that Jesus is him. And, and twice we read this prophecy quoted in the book of Acts, one when Peter is preaching and one when Stephen is preaching, and they, they quote the Deuteronomy 18 passage about God sending a prophet like Moses. And um, that would be found in Acts 3.22 when Peter is preaching and in Acts 7. 37, when Stephen is preaching. So twice this prophecy in uh, Deuteronomy 18 is quoted in the New Testament as being about Christ and fulfilled in Christ. I might point out that the wording of the passage in 18, it says that there, I will raise up a prophet like you, and there will be a prophet like me, Moses says. Uh, if you look at Deuteronomy chapter 34, In the first nine verses, it tells how that Moses died and that Joshua, the son of Nun, was uh, full of the spirit and wisdom and replaced Moses. So there's a sense in which Moses filled with the, uh, Joshua filled with the spirit seems to be the replacement for Moses. But look at verse 10. But since then there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Now, since... It specifically says God will raise up another prophet like Moses. And at the end of the book, after Moses dies, even after Joshua has taken the lead, the writer says there has not yet arisen a prophet like Moses. So the prophecy is, at least in some aspects, unfulfilled in Joshua. Joshua is a type and a shadow, and in, at one level seems to fulfill the promise. Uh, but even... Those last verses of Deuteronomy, we don't know who wrote them, but the chances are Joshua wrote them. And it may be that Joshua himself says, I'm not the ultimate fulfillment of that. I've taken over, but there hasn't risen up a prophet like Moses yet. So this prophecy uh, is really a prophecy about the Messiah, one that was not fulfilled in the Old Testament time and was fulfilled in Christ, according to New Testament authors. Okay, we don't need to 
say much about the authorship because we've gone through the other books of the Pentateuch and pointed out that they all, except for Genesis, they all specifically say they're written by Moses. The New, uh, the New Testament uh, quotes Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy and says it's Moses who wrote them. And Deuteronomy many times throughout the book says, you know, Moses said these words, this is, you know, Moses wrote this song, and so forth. So we see that Moses is the author. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament agree with that. Where was it? It was uh, probably between the year 1450 and 1400 B.C. That is in the, in the uh, we'd have to say, the, the late 15th century B.C. And it was when they were encamped on the plains of Moab, right across the Jordan River from Jericho, which is also where they were when numbers closed. So they're still there. They won't be for very long because within a month of this time they cross the Jordan and they begin their conquest of the land under Joshua's leadership. But at the time that Moses gives these speeches, they are still not in the promised land. And they, uh, they're just short of it, actually. Now it says in chapter 1 and verse 2 of Deuteronomy that the distance between uh, Egypt, where they began, or Mount, Mount Sinai, actually, the distance between Mount Sinai and Kadesh Barnea, which is where they, they were when they sent the spies into the land, is 11 days walk. The distance is actually about 165 miles. So 11 days is calculated to be about 15 miles a day. You can walk more than 15 miles in a day, except when you've got a lot of sheep and children and things like that, you move more slowly. So uh, the writer of uh, Deuteronomy considered that 15 miles was a good day's walk for them, and they could have done it in 11 days. And we know that was 165 miles just because it can be measured. So they could have gotten there a lot earlier. They didn't have to wander for 40 years in the wilderness. They could have gone right into the Promised Land a couple weeks after they left Mount Sinai if they had uh, been more trusting. And their, their, their failure to do so, of course, is brought up as a lesson to us both in 1 Corinthians 10 and in uh, in Hebrews chapters 3 and 4 that their, their mistake and their failure is uh, a warning to us we're told so and of course the last thing about the setting is that Moses was about to die I've already mentioned that so that's, that's what we've got now before we go through the book I want to bring out something that scholars ever since the mid 1900's have been saying about Deuteronomy uh, a teacher who doesn't bring this up would be considered to be irresponsible Though I have to say, I don't place as much stock in it as some do. And that is, in the year 1954, when I was one year old, a scholar named G.E. Mendenhall published two articles in the Biblical Archaeologist in which he pointed out similarities between the book of Deuteronomy and what they call suzerainty treaties in the Middle East from the second millennium B.C., now, the second millennium B.C. would be between 1000 and 2000 B.C., between the time of David and the time of, of uh, Abraham. In other words, these stories happened during the second millennium B.C. And it is known that <clears throat> uh, when a great nation would conquer a lesser nation and bring them under their rule, the lesser nation would be called a vassal, and the greater nation would be called a suzerain. So if, uh, for example, when Babylon conquered the regions, or Assyria did, or Egypt, any these great nations conquered lesser nations, and they put them under tribute. Basically what it meant was that these nations had to be loyal to the great king and had to pay tribute to him. And the, the conquered, subjugated nations were called vassals, and, uh, and the great nation was called a suzerain. Now, when such conquest took place, they'd Right, they'd have a treaty. The conquered smaller nation would sign a treaty with the suzerain, and he would sign it too. And this was called a suzerainty treaty. How do you spell suzerain? You want to know? Yeah. Okay, it's S U Z E R A I N. S U Z E R A I N. Suzerain. 
And if you want to say suzerainty, you put a T-Y at the end of it, suzerainty, treaty. That's a treaty between a suzerain and its vassals. Now, the thing is, archaeologists have examined a lot of these ancient suzerainty treaties and see that they all follow a certain legal structure. They all have the same features in the same order in these treaties. And what Mendenhall was saying in 1954 is that Deuteronomy kind of follows that same structure. And therefore, one could argue that Deuteronomy is written to be like a suzerainty treaty between God and Israel. God being the great king, Israel being the vassal kingdom under him. Now, the, the main value of this particular observation would be that God is the king of Israel, and that's not new information here. When God first called them out of Egypt at Mount Sinai, he said, if you, can, if you keep my covenant and obey my voice, then you'll be a kingdom to me. Kingdom of priests, you'll be a nation of, of my own. So, you know, to say, well, God was their king, and they were, a, uh, they were vassals under God, is not really introducing anything that we didn't already know. And apart from that, the whole information about the suzerainty treaty thing, I'm not really sure that it has any practical value for us to know. It's just one of those things that scholars are supposed to acknowledge because it's a scholarly discovery. And so if you teach to an army and you don't, don't say anything about its likeness to a suzerainty treaty, you're considered to not know what you're talking about, you're not up to date on modern scholarship, and so forth. But now I've let you know. <laughs> I'm up to date, but I don't see any real practical value in it, except that it would illustrate that if it is written to be like an ancient suzerainty treaty, then it is acknowledging that God is their king, they're subject to him, and these treaties had different characteristics. I'll run through them for you since this is something that uh, will be on the test. Actually, I don't know what will be on the test. I don't even know if you have written tests, but if you're in a Bible college, it would be on the test. Okay? So here's, here's the features of a suzerainty treaty. First, there's a preamble, which is just a formal opening. Secondly, there's a historical prologue. Now, the historical prologue basically reviews the relations in the past between the two parties what the historical relationship has been between them before this arrangement was struck. The third thing are general stipulations of the treaty. The broader obligations of both parties. I mean, the suzerain is conquering them, but he's going to provide protection for them, too. And, uh, and yet the vassal has got requirements upon them. So the general requirements are then, and then later, just after that, the fifth feature is specific uh, stipulations. So there's broad requirements like in the Ten Commandments, and then there's more specific requirements, smaller issues, more details. Uh, the fifth thing in a suzerainty treaty is arrangements for the preservation of the copies. So what's going to happen when this copy wears out? Who's going to be in charge of making sure that we have fresh copies made and so forth? And how is this document going to be preserved, essentially, is what it's saying. The sixth part of the suzerainty treaty issues blessings upon the parties if they fulfill the terms of the treaty and curses upon them if they do not. This is a major feature of Deuteronomy when you get to chapter 28. And then... At the very end, there's just a review of all that, all the, all the below, all the above. You know, um, everything, and it's kind of reviewed at the end and summarized. And so this is how these treaties were laid out. It can be said that Deuteronomy follows that general order. Now, I would say this: I agree that it follows sort of the general pattern. There are exceptions, though. There are parts of it that don't really, to my mind, fit the pattern perfectly, but. I have no interest in disproving this connection or proving it. It's, it's not an important one to me. It's important to people who want to show that they're up to date on scholarship about Deuteronomy. I'm not interested in proving that, but 
but I didn't want to be, I want to be invited back, and if I didn't say that, I'd be considered to know nothing about the subject. All right. So, now that we should go through the book, and it's a, a pretty long book, as a matter of fact. It, chapters one through four are sort of the, the introduction to the book. It could be said to be Moses' first discourse. There are three more. But, um, well, I shouldn't say chapters one through four. Chapter one, verses one through four is the introduction. Then the first discourse begins at chapter one, verse five, and goes through chapter four. So chapters, essentially chapters one through five, four are the first discourse. From chapter 1, verse 5, to chapter 4, verse 40, is the, the first discourse of Moses, really. Um, there, is a, uh, there are four verses of introduction at the beginning. Now, the first discourse, Moses is reviewing things. He reviews uh, the Exodus. He reviews uh, the fact that uh, there was a time when he appointed uh, subordinates to himself to kind of take on the court cases that people were bringing to him. He was being worn out by too much activity of that kind. So he had appointed rulers over tens and rulers over fifties and rulers over hundreds and rulers over thousands. You may remember that from Exodus 18, really. That was actually Jethro's suggestion to Moses. It was Moses' father-in-law that came up with the idea. But Moses doesn't mention Jethro. He just says, I, I did this. Um, and then he talks about uh, the spies going into the land of Canaan, and he indicates that he actually mentions that they came to him and wanted to send spies into Canaan. Now, when we actually read about this in the 13th chapter of Numbers, there's no mention of the people asking for it, just as God told Moses to send spies in. And uh, so, is this a contradiction? Well, people who look for contradictions could call it one. I don't look for them. I find ways to harmonize them if possible, and this is not difficult. Apparently, the people came to Moses and said, let's send spies in. Well, probably Moses thought this doesn't sound like a very faithful thing to do. God's promised us, why do we need spies? But he consulted the Lord, and the Lord said, do it. Mm -hmm. So, Numbers tells us that God told him to do it. Deuteronomy tells us that the people were the ones who suggested it first, but did not deny the fact that God then told them to do it. So, he goes through and he tells about how they were faithless, how, they, uh, how the ten spies brought back the evil report and how God made them wander in the wilderness for those 40 years. And that's largely what he's retelling in the first four chapters. We don't need to go over it in detail. The last part of chapter 4, verses 41 through 43, are not really part of that discourse. Um, well, chapter 41 through 43 is just a recitation of the cities of refuge. We already know about the cities of refuge, and it mentions them again at the end of chapter 4. Also, chapter 4 ends with an introduction to the second discourse. So maybe the chapter division could have been more fortuitous, um, but chapter 4, verses 44 through 49, introduces the second discourse. Now, the second discourse is quite long. It's chapters 5 through 26. That's the second discourse. The first one was only four chapters. The second one is like 25 uh, or 20 chapters, 20, 22 chapters, I guess it would be. Um, and in, these, in this discourse, it's mostly review and expansion on the laws that God gave, beginning with the Ten Commandments, which are listed in chapter 5. And then more laws, 20-something chapters of laws are given there. We will go and look at them a little more closely, uh, but I want to just give a broader outline first. After the second discourse, chapters 27 through 28 are the blessings and curses that they can anticipate. If they're faithful, they'll have great blessings. If they're unfaithful, they'll have great curses upon them. We'll say more about that also in a little bit. Then we have the third discourse. Pardon? Which chapter was it? 27 and 28. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Chapters 27 and 28 are the blessings and the curses. The third discourse, 
is only two chapters long. It's chapters 29 and 30. All right. And then the remaining chapters are usually seen as appendices. Um, chapter 31, verses 1 through 29, is instructing the priests and the Levites and Joshua about what their duties are going to be. Of course, most of which is repeat of earlier material. That's an appendix about the priests, the Levites, and Joshua's duty. That's chapter 31, verses 1 through 29. Then chapter 31, verse 30, through the next chapter, through chapter 32, is what we call the Song of Moses. This song, Moses wrote this song and sang it to Israel uh, so that they would not forget it. Now, you may notice it's easier to memorize songs than just text. There's something about setting something to music and having it in poetic form that somehow makes it a little harder to forget. And uh, so that may be why he did it. He, he put it in song. And this song reminds them of how God had saved them out of Egypt, but it also reminds them about all the times they've rebelled against him during the 40 years of wandering. And it's a, kind of a rebuke to them and a warning about their, about their future. And, in fact, it, it actually predicts their failures in the future. So that's the second appendix would be the Song of Moses, chapter 31, verse 30, through chapter 32. The third appendix would be Moses' blessing on the people, just like Jacob in Genesis 49 blessed his 12 sons before he died, so Moses blesses the 12 tribes, and it's sort of like, kind of, sort of like Genesis 49, but... The blessings are not identical, but they kind of have the same tone to them. They, 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 it reminds us of Jacob blessing his 12 sons. Uh, here Moses blesses the 12 tribes in chapter 33. That's the third appendix. And the fourth appendix would be just the death of Moses, which is chapter 34, which is told rather briefly. We're told that Moses, when he died, uh, God took his body and hid it. Didn't let anyone know where it was where it was. Uh, Hidden. He was first allowed to go up on Mount uh, Pisgah and, and look across the river and see the promised land on a clear day. Uh, Moses kept begging God, couldn't you let me go into the promised land? And God said, no, because you struck the rock that time. Uh, you don't, don't bug me about this anymore, he finally said. Mm -hmm. And Moses is still kind of bitter about that because he keeps saying, when he's telling the Israelites the story, he says, God is angry at me for your sake. Uh, God was very angry at me for your sake, he keeps saying. Meaning that because I had misrepresented God to you, God was offended on your behalf and he's angry at me. Uh, so he's, you know, he, Moses didn't seem to really get over that. It was a great disappointment to him. But he did get to see the land before he died. And once he saw the land, uh, the Lord took him. Not into heaven. I mean, that, that is, he didn't go up like Enoch or something like that in the sky or Elijah. But he died, and God buried him somewhere, and no one knows where. Uh, that's interesting, because everyone knows where Abram and Isaac and Jacob are buried. Uh, but Moses' burial was kept a secret as far as its location. This is very possibly to prevent the, the Jews of later generations from making it a shrine and, and worshiping it as a place that you know their founder... They, they always had a tendency toward idolatry, and he, God may not have wanted them to know where it was for that reason. Anyway, this is the general outline. Now, I just want to go through the various chapters and tell you what, in general, they contain, especially in the first discourse, which is the long one, because that's like 20-something chapters. So... Um, to simply say that the second discourse is a, a review and explanation of stipulations, that's, that's how I summarized it. It doesn't really tell you much about the content. So we're going to go through that discourse, chapters 5 through 26, is the most uh, important section. So 
It'll be brief, though, because I do want to give you, remember I mentioned I want to give you guys a Q&A if I can at the end. I'm going to try to go through this as quickly as possible. When you come to Chapter 5, that's after the first discourse is closed. That's after the cities of refuge have been discussed. Now Moses starts his second discourse, and it starts by reminding them of the Ten Commandments. These Ten Commandments, not surprisingly, are the same as the Ten Commandments given to them in Exodus, Chapter 20. But there is one difference that's kind of interesting, because in Exodus 20, when the Sabbath commandment was given, and this is just about the main difference between the two lists, God, God gave as a reason that they should keep the Sabbath because God had rested on the seventh day after creating the world in six days. That's the reason he gave. He says, for the Lord God made the heavens and the earth and all that is in them in six days, and he rested on the seventh day. That's Exodus. But in Deuteronomy, when he tells them to keep the Sabbath, he says, because you were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought you out and gave you rest in the, in, you know, from your slavery, and therefore keep the Sabbath. So uh, it would show, first of all, that there's more than one reason that God had in mind for them keeping the Sabbath. But uh, the fact that one of the reasons was because God brought them out of slavery means that the Sabbath law particularly... Uh, relates to them as a nation and their history. It's not something that is true of the Gentiles. We were not brought out of Egypt like that. Uh, so in Exodus chapter 31, God had said that the Sabbath law was a sign of himself, uh, between himself and Israel, of their covenant. And so because he had brought them out of Egypt, he gives us the reason for keeping the Sabbath in Deuteronomy 5. And of course, the reason I bring this up is because God never did impose Sabbath keeping on Gentiles. It was given only to Israel. And when people say, well, we should be keeping the Sabbath, uh, they're trying to put us under the Jewish law that was given only to one nation, Israel. Now, it is true that the church is seen as a spiritual Israel, but being a spiritual Israel is not the same thing as being natural Israel. As a spiritual Israelite, I wasn't brought out of Egypt. I was not a slave in Egypt. My ancestors were not slaves in Egypt. Therefore, the reason for keeping Sabbath does not apply to me, and nor any of the other ritual laws of Israel. So there are, I say that because there's so many people today who are moving more in the direction of saying, you know, we should be keeping the Saturday Sabbath. We Christians should be keeping the Sabbath. Or we should keep the festivals of Israel. There's, there are people who say we should be keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. None of this is biblically true. Chapter 6. Though it has many things in it, the most important things in it are the Shema. In chapter 6, verse 4 through 9, I will read you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Then he says, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them. When you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, the emphasis here is on uh, passing along the law that God has given them to the next generation. This is already the second generation, the generation after Mount Sinai. And he says, now you need to continue to pass this along, which they obviously did not do, not well. Because if, if in Josiah's day they didn't even know what the law was when they found it, they obviously had not taught it to their children through, faithfully on down. Well, some did. It's just that it got neglected. This passing down of the faith to children is certainly a Christian Duty. It says in Ephesians chapter 6 that fathers should rear their children in this nurture and the admonition of the Lord. So, I mean, parents have a duty to pass on their faith to their children, if they can, to do their best, at least. And that's what he's telling them. Now, the Jews took some of this more literally than I think was intended. He says you should bind the law on your hand and on your forehead and, and post it on the doors of your house and on your gates. Now, the Jews... In some cases, the most religious Jews have done this very literally. They've taken little boxes made of leather, 
and they've tied them to their hands and, and around their heads they wear these boxes on their forehead. They're called phylacteries. And they put in them little passages of scripture, of the law. So now they've bound the law to their hands and to their forehead in these phylacteries. Now, they're basing it on this command here, though I think they're missing the point. Also, the Jews, uh, they sometimes, the religious Jews, will, will have little boxes uh, or containers of scripture that they put on the doors of their houses, mm -hmm. or the doorposts, based on this commandment. But it seems to me that what God is just saying, you need to keep these laws ever before you. When you're coming in the house, when you're going out the house, when you pass through the door, remember the law. Uh, the hand and the forehead represent your actions and your thoughts. Your hand is, your, is what your works are done with. Your, your forehead is between your eyes, he calls it. It's where your focus is, what you're always looking at, what you're always thinking about. To bind the law to your hand and to your and before your eyes is, I believe, a figure of speech. It simply means that your actions and your thoughts should always be governed by and, uh, and, and mindful of the law of God. Now, Jesus kind of made fun of the Pharisees for their phylacteries. The Jews took it so literally. And Jesus said, you in Matthew 23, he says, you Jews, you scribes, first you make broad phylacteries. But he says they're hypocrites and their hearts are not with God. But they wear these passages of the law on their foreheads and on their hands, as modern uh, Hasidic Jews can be seen to do today, at least in Israel. You probably find it in other countries too, but not so often. But in Israel, you'll certainly see Jews walking around with these phylacteries on their heads based on this scripture. But I think they're missing the point. It's not God doesn't care that you have written scriptures tied to your forehead, but that the law is on your mind. And, uh, and your hands are bound to it, you, that is, you're governed by it. That's what this command, assuming, uh, is thought to mean. Now, chapter 7, perhaps the main thing that we would get from chapter 7 is that God chose Israel not because of anything good they had done, nor because of any particular promise they showed to be a great nation. He says, you were a small nation. I didn't choose you because you're a big nation or a righteous nation. Uh, he says in verse 6, You are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples of the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you and because he would keep his oath, he swore to your fathers. Okay, and he promised them, and he kept a promise to them. Now, the point here he's wanting to make is that they should not think that they are something really great because they happen to be God's chosen people. God didn't choose them because of anything about them that was very great. They weren't a big nation. They weren't a more righteous nation than others. And therefore, the idea is don't get proud. In fact, be humble. God chose you despite the fact that you had nothing about you to commend yourself to him. And therefore, there's nothing to be arrogant about. And, there, and by the way, the Jewish people sometimes have done better and sometimes worse at obeying this command. Sometimes the Jews have thought that they are superior to all Gentiles because they are the chosen people. And this is a, an attitude that Paul had to deflate in his Jewish readers in the book of Romans. He pointed out to them, just because you have the law, you think you're a teacher of babes and an instructor of fools and, and that you're... You're wiser than other people. He says, but you have law, but you don't keep the law. He said, a Gentile who keeps the law is a better Jew than you are. Even though you're Jewish, you don't keep the law. But you think you're better because you're Jewish, because you have the law. This is a problem the Jews had in their attitude sometimes. And chapter 7 seems to be an appeal to be humble about this. And then chapters 9 through 11... Uh, I won't go into detail about it. It's basically a catalog of the mistakes they've made, the times they rebelled, how many times they grumbled and God had to punish them. Those stories are largely found in uh, Exodus and in Numbers. He reviews some of those in chapters 9 through 11. When you come to chapter 12, he 
says repeatedly something about the place that the Lord shall choose to place his name. Now, he's, he's basically saying when you are settled in the land of Canaan, which they would be soon after this, you need to bring your sacrifices to the place that the Lord chooses to set his name. That is, you can't just offer sacrifices anywhere you want to, in your backyard or something like that. You have to, if you have sacrifices, you bring them to the holy place that God chooses to place his name there. Now, what's interesting about this, you know, I told you liberal scholars don't think that Moses wrote this, but that, uh, you know, it was a much later writing based on traditions that came down, and it was written hundreds of years, thousands of years even, after Moses' time, over a thousand And yet, after David's time, Jerusalem was clearly the holy place where the temple was built and, and where it was the holy place where they brought their sacrifices. And anyone, any Jew writing this chapter after David's time and making this stuff up, in other words, they wouldn't be so obscure about the place that the Lord's going to choose. Moses didn't know where God was going to choose because he lived before they settled in the land. And so he speaks vaguely. You shall always bring it to the place that the Lord shall choose to place his name. Anyone writing after the time of David would say, to Jerusalem. To Jerusalem where the temple is. But this was written apparently before that, as of course it claims to be. And Moses couldn't identify Jerusalem. In fact, when they came into the land, they didn't conquer Jerusalem right away either. They, the tabernacle was in a number of places, at Nob and at Shiloh and uh, different places. So, eventually when David came along, the same thing, he conquered the city of Jerusalem and made that the capital, and that's where Solomon built the temple later. But anyone writing this at a later date than David's date, giving these instructions would have said Jerusalem. But the fact that the, the chapter shows no knowledge of Jerusalem indicates, of course, it's written earlier than what critics sometimes think it was. Chapter 13 begins by warning about false prophets, and it goes into warnings against idolatry. Now, false prophets were usually simply prophets that would lead people to worship false gods. We think of a false prophet as just someone who says something's going to happen and it doesn't happen. Well, that's, that's one way to note a, a false prophet. If they pr prophesy something that doesn't happen, then they're false. But the false prophets had a motive. They wanted to lead people to follow other gods. And they wanted to compromise the pure religion of Judaism with other religions. And they were often motivated by this because the other religions were so much more sensual. Most of the other gods were worshipped by having orgies and getting drunk. Whereas worshipping God required you to live a holy life. So there was always those in the Jewish community who would like to have had the morality of the law loosened up a little bit. And so they could fake or maybe even really under demon power, they could prophesy things that would cause people to go the wrong way. And sometimes they would even show signs and wonders correctly. Now I want to say this, before we look at chapter 13, if you look at 18, you remember that that's the chapter where Moses said, God will raise up another prophet like me. But in that context, he told them to be, be careful because there's going to be false prophets too. And he says in verse 20, Deuteronomy 18, 20, But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. Okay, so if a prophet predicts something in the name of the Lord and it doesn't happen, then God didn't inspire him because God's prophets would not make mistakes like that. So one way to recognize a false prophet is he predicts something that doesn't come true. But chapter 13 makes it more confusing in a little bit because this prophet he talked about in the opening verses predicts something that does come true. But he's still a false prophet for reasons that we'll see. Chapter 13 says... In verse 1, if there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, 
and the sign or the wonder that it gives you comes to pass. Okay, so this time it doesn't fail to come to pass. It says, of which he spoke to you saying, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Now this is interesting because he's describing a false prophet. Now I want to make clear, the term false prophet, which is found several times in the New Testament, is not found in the Old Testament. That is, the phrase false prophet is not an Old Testament term. It, it just talks about prophets. But many of the prophets are false. And it tells you, you know, anyone who prophesies is just called a prophet. But there's some of them are from God and some are not. Some are true prophets, some are false. And he says, one way you know they're false, uh, we saw in chapter 18, is if they predict something that doesn't come to pass. In chapter 13 it says, even if they predict something that does come to pass, if they're leading you to worship other gods, they're false. Now he says, don't believe them. And you'd think he would say because they're inspired by demons or something like that, which they might in fact be. If they give signs and wonders and it comes to pass, they might have demonic power. But he doesn't even mention the devil's activities here. I mean, he doesn't identify the devil or the demons. He just says, this situation arises because God is testing you. God allows deceivers to be among you, just like he allowed the devil to be in the garden with Eve. He allows us to be tested. The whole purpose that God created us for is that we would reign with him, but we can't reign with him if we're not loyal. He's got to test our loyalty. Mm -hmm. Eve was tested and she failed. Israel was tested many times and failed. We don't have to fail. God warns. Moses says, listen, if a prophet comes up and says, go after other gods, that's not, that's not a good prophet to follow. Don't do it. God is testing you to see if you love the Lord with all your heart and soul. It may, in fact, be a demonically inspired prophet, but he doesn't mention that. He basically just says, just know that the reason that prophet is there is because you're now being tested. Your loyalty to God is being tested. And then he goes on the rest of the chapter to talk about idolatry and, and, and how they should have a zero tolerance for idolatry. Uh, if, if anyone, even in your family, says, let's go worship other gods, kill them, basically. I mean, they're, they're, it's the death penalty for idolatry, and that's what chapter 13 gives us. Now Israel didn't follow that zero tolerance policy. They didn't obey. And because of that they had false prophets a lot in their later history. In fact at one time they had 4,000 prophets of Baal. Uh, Elijah had them all killed because the law says they should be. They're advocating worshiping other gods. Uh, that's a death penalty. That's a capital crime. So we have the false prophets and the idols and zero tolerance for adultery in chapter 13. Uh, chapter 14 uh, goes through that list of clean and unclean animals. Uh, it was also in Leviticus 11, determining an animal that was clean or unclean. A, a mammal had to have two characteristics to be clean. A mammal had to have a cloven hoof and chew the cud. In my opinion, this speaks of symbolically. Chewing the cud you know what chewing the cud is? Cows do it. Goats and sheep do it. That's why they could be clean animals. And they also have a cloven hoof, a, a split hoof. Uh, chewing the cud is where uh, certain animals have multiple stomachs. And uh, you know, you ever wonder how a cow can produce so much protein for us to eat when it only eats grass? Where's all that protein come from? How can it eat grass, which doesn't have very much protein, and produce all that meat? Where's that come from? Well, it comes from the grass. But they have to get a lot more out of the grass than you would get eating that grass. They got to, they've got to trans, take all the, all the nutritional value from the grass and draw it out. So what they do is they chew it, they swallow it. As I understand, it goes into one of their stomachs. But then they, re, they regurgitate it into their mouth and chew it some more and swallow it again. And as I understand it, they, they do this repeatedly. And so that the same mouthful of food gets chewed up a bunch of times and uh, it, it, they draw every bit of nutrition out of that thing you know before they pass it through their system this regurgitating into their mouth from their stomach food that they had already chewed and swallowed is that which of course gives them 
the most possible nutrition from the grass. That's called chewing the cud. It's called being a ruminant. Animals that do that, we call them ruminants. And doing that is called ruminating. Now, ruminating or chewing the cud has a parallel in you can, your thought, you can ruminate in your thoughts about something. Sometimes that, that term is even used that way in literature. That someone's, we're just ruminating. It's the same words meditating. To meditate on scripture, it's like when you read scripture, you think about it, hopefully. You get something out of it. Then you have to go away and do something else. But then you can bring it back to your mind again. You can regurgitate it to your mind and ruminate on, on some more. Get something fresh out of it. You might have to forget it for a while and go do something else, but you can bring it up again. It, once you know scripture, you can think about it over and over again. That's meditation. That's meditating. And, and so it cleanses your mind. It, it, it fills your mind with truth. It nourishes you spiritually. The cloven hoof of the animal probably is a reference to walking differently than other animals do. It has a different kind of foot, therefore it walks differently. Now, clean animals represent clean people. Unclean animals represent unclean people. The, the characteristics of the clean animals, I think, have spiritual parallels. And that those parallels are that, uh, you know, our minds are meditating on the Word of God, our, our walk is different than the people of the world walk. We, we live out our life differently. We walk uh, in the ways of God, and we fill our minds with the ways of God. We meditate on His Word, and we, we feed on His Word. People who feed on His Word and who walk according to His Word would be, no doubt, those who have the spiritual characteristics that are symbolized by an animal chewing the cud and, and having a, a divided hoof. All right, well, we're going to take a break here. Um, but, the, but chapter 14 just goes over the clean and unclean animal laws, which, again, is a repeat of Leviticus 11. And at the end, it talks about the tithing, which we've talked about in, in Numbers also previously. Um, I, guess I, I guess this is the point where I'll give you a break. I uh, always hate to break it, but uh, we've got to do so at some point. So we're going to take a break at this point, and we'll come back and finish it up next time. And if we're lucky, we'll have time for Q&A. I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> we shall see. <laughs>